Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning at First Baptist Church in Middlesbrough, Kentucky. Glad to see you out here. Uh, welcome to the people that are watching us on TV. And especially welcome to those of you who are new to us, guests, um, if you're back visiting us and part of our family uh, but away from home, we're glad you're here today. If you are a guest today, if you'll take the edge of your bulletin and tear it off and fill in some information about yourself so we can know something about you, you can put it in the offering plate when it comes past you. I know you noticed the bright gold list in your bulletin. This is important to our children here in Middlesbrough City Schools. If you can look at the list and see if you can pick some of those things you'd like to get and bring them to church and put them in one of the boxes, we'll get them to students the first week of school. You still have about a week and a half left that you can get those in. And if you don't have time to go shopping, if you want to just designate a check, there are some people that will go and buy some things and fill up um, the list of things that, that we don't receive. Today, our group from Passport is on the road. They've uh, been in Maryland overnight, and they're on their way home. Be here about 6 o'clock tonight, so keep them in your prayers today as they are traveling. And then on Thursday morning, our kids leave for Passport Kids in Crossville, Tennessee, and they're going to have a great half a week of um, camp. It's a good experience at, Cross um, at Crossville. Uh, it's a nice location close to us, but just far enough away from home for the kids to have a good adventure. Um, there's a group going to be here tomorrow that's going to help uh, in the flood relief. A, a church is bringing a group, and they're going to work all day and get some more help to some of our people that need it. So keep those people in your prayers, and, and especially the people that are in need of help in their homes and don't really have someone to turn to. We're hoping to be that place where they can come and ask for help. Would you take this time now to greet those people around you? Let's sing a hymn of praise together. Come thou fount of every blessing. Hymn number 295 as we stand together and join our voices.
Good morning. Will you join me in a prayer? Father, we come before you this morning, our hearts full of love for thee and for your blessed faith in us that to carry out your work on this earth. We are grateful for your obvious uh, help in getting our city back in order again, and we thank you for that, that no one was seriously hurt or damaged, and we appreciate that so much. We have several of our members in the nursing home and in hospital, and we want to remember them as we pray. We just have so many things on our heart this morning that it's hard to say, but, but we love, love you and praise you and give you all the thanks that we have. In Jesus' name, we pray. Thank you. Would you take your hymnal and look at 294, Let Us Sing to the Lord, and we'll read this responsively. Let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us make a joyful noise to him, songs of praise. Let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God. And we are the people of this pasture. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be revered above all gods. The God who made the world and everything in it does not live in shrines made by human hands. Since he himself gives all mortals life and breath and all things. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what has drawn you to this place? We have come to worship the rock of our salvation. God is not confined to this place. God is always with you. God came with you. We have come to worship with each other. How do you propose to worship so great a God? Through the praise and prayer, with the tears of confession and joy, we will bow at the God's feet. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the earth, the sea, and sky. What do you have to offer so great a God? We offer our lives and our livelihood to God, to each other, to all who seek. We bring offerings of mercy, justice, and peace. When you leave this place, God will be with you. We shall live as we worship, aware of God's presence. The children or children at heart are invited forward for children's time. morning. I have a question. Have you ever gotten a letter in the mail? It's pretty cool, isn't it? Maybe your friend's been away at summer camp and he or she's telling you how cool it is, how awesome it is. Um, let's see, what kind of letters are there? First of all, there's junk mail, which nobody likes. It's like, buy our stuff, blah, blah, blah. And then there's bills, which adults really don't like at all. Um, there's invitations. You ever gotten an invitation to a birthday party in the mail? Well, I brought a certain kind of letter with me today. Let's see what it is. It's a
It's a thank you note. Have you ever written a thank you note or gotten a thank you note in the mail? Maybe someone bought you a birthday present or a Christmas present and you wanted to thank them for it or something like that? Well, I got to thinking, if there's anybody that deserves a thank you note, it's Jesus. Because Jesus has done so much for us. He's, he showed us how to live a good life and how to be nice to other people, how to forgive other people. So I wrote Jesus a thank you note, and I wanted to give you guys thank you notes for you to write to Jesus. But why don't we pray right now and thank him right now, okay? Dear Jesus, we thank you for everything that you've done for us, everything you've shown us, and everything that we know you're going to continue to do for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Join me in a hymn of response number 561. We're going to sing the first verse of Shall We Gather at the River, or you can look right there in your bulletin. Psalm 145 is one of those psalms that offers, as Evan was saying a moment ago, a word of thank you, a word of praise, a word of, of doxology, uh, a word of gratitude to God for who God is and for what God does. Hear these words from the psalmist. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall laud your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. The might of your awesome deeds shall be proclaimed, and I will declare your greatness. They shall celebrate the fame of your abundant goodness, and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his compassion is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord. And all your faithful shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power and to make known to all people your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, satisfying the desire of every living thing. The Lord is just in all his ways and kind in all his doings. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of all who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. 
The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. May these be our words of response to our good God as we pray together. O King of kings and Lord of lords, holy, immortal, holy, and mighty, you who is from everlasting to everlasting, most gracious, most merciful, most loving, faithful God, maybe our most appropriate worship to you this morning would be to sit and read these words of the psalmist over and over and over again. For too often we spend so little time in doxology to you, thanking you, praising you, extolling your virtues, singing of your goodness to us, giving thanks for your mercy and love. Instead, what we spend our time doing is most often looking in the mirror, thinking about ourselves first, celebrating our own goodness, thinking about our own needs. Forgive us, O God, when the first words out of our mouths to you are all about us. As we come to worship you this morning, we come to be reoriented back towards you. We have turned in other directions this week, some of us inward, some of us downward. Help us now as we worship to turn back towards you to face you with the fullness of our lives so that we might meet the fullness of your grace and be transformed. Help us to hear these words from the psalmist. Remind us this morning of the enoughness of all that you are and the grace of all that we do have. For too often this week, we have lived into the other words around us about what we needed, about what we lack, about what we are missing, about what we don't have. Remind us that we have what we need in you. Oh God, help us to hear these words of the psalmist. Remind us this morning of your faithfulness. Speak to us again, for too often too many in our world this week have felt forgotten, have felt cast aside, have felt tread upon. Remind us of your faithfulness. As those in our community, as those in our family of faith, wait on surgeries, work through rehabs, continue to go through treatments, remind us of your faithfulness. Cause our feet to stand firm upon your promise that as you have been, so you are and so you will be. God, remind us of these words of the psalmist that you are love. Too often we see ourselves as the prodigal run away. That we've spent all that we had, all that we took. And the mess that we have gotten ourselves in with our lives. Well, who would want to help us out of that? And we wonder if there is room back at your table God, help our hearts this morning to run to your welcoming arms of love. 
For this week we have experienced much in this world that is unloving, that is hateful, that is hurtful, that has caused us pain. God, soothe our woundedness with the healing balm of your everlasting love. O oh God, we hear in these words that it is you who are merciful and slow to anger. And though we often try to be as you are, too many times this week our hearts have raged at injustice, at differences, at decisions, even at circumstances. And our need to be in control and our need to hold the power and our need to be right has caused us to act any way but Christ-like. Oh God, this morning as we worship together, calm our spirits and help us to trust ourselves and our lives into your mercy. Oh God, as we seek to continue to live and serve and worship and learn together, God, give us a new and deeper understanding of what it means to be Christian, to follow Christ. God, in all that we say, in all that we do, in the ways that we relate, in the ways that we live, Help us to embody you. Help us in our flesh to put on the likeness of Christ. So that when others see us, when others hear us, when others spend time around us, they are drawn towards you. Our Savior, the one who is with us, who never leaves us, the one who walks with us now, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Number 478, God is calling through the whisper. This is our stewardship hymn as we join our voices together.
God, you are calling. Can we hear you? Are we listening? Give us ears to hear your call as we get up in the morning and as we go through our days. Open our eyes to see the people around us who seem invisible. Give us voices to bless those who need to hear a blessing. Give us your grace to share. Amen.
every now and then I feel like I have to give a preamble uh, when I get up here to, to begin a sermon because um, I think about, I look at the title of my sermon, Let Go and Grow, and I think, gosh, you know, that there's a lot of loaded language there. There are a lot of different ideas that, that many people in this room might really differ on. What does growth look like? What does it mean to grow in this stage of life versus this stage of life? For a little one, growing is just its adding more teeth and it's getting taller and it's changing clothes sizes and new words and, and all of that. And for someone who uh, is moving towards the end of life, growth has a very different kind of idea. When we talk about what growth means in our own individual lives versus what growth means in our corporate life, like, like church life, there are different ideas as well. And before I get to the scripture, I want to begin with a few stories. There's a young couple who are fresh out of college. They got married uh, only a few weeks after graduation. They met when they were in college and uh, and soon after they got married they began talking about how long they wanted to wait until they had kids and they both agreed we want to wait years we're not ready we're not ready we we have careers to begin maybe more school to do we we have more time that we need but accidents happen and the nine-month countdown began and a few weeks of frustration and anger at this sudden change in their life soon turned to excitement about this new addition to their family. And there at the birth, family and friends, uh, fellow graduates from college, uh, family and from out of town, they were all there to help celebrate, and there was so much excitement there in the room. And, and then a few months later, after everyone had kind of gone home and gone back to their own lives, and it was just the husband and wife and the new baby boy, the husband's friends call and say, hey, we're getting together out of town for the weekend. You want to come? Sure. Yes. I want to get out of town. So he goes. Her friends call the next weekend. And she says to her husband, hey, I want to get out of town. I want to go and get away. Is that going to be okay? And he says, well, wait a minute. I'm going out of town this weekend too. We're getting together again, but this time in another place. They've got some fun things going on. And uh, her friends, she calls him back and she says, can I bring my new baby? And they say, no, just adults. No baby. And so she tries to find a sitter. She can't do it, so she can't go. He comes back after his second weekend away, and she says, what about me? What about me? When do I get my turn? And he says, well, this is your job. You stay here with the baby, and I'm going to go on about the things I want to do. She says, what about me? This isn't what I had in mind. I thought that we were a team. He says, well, this wasn't what I had in mind either. This is your thing. Change has happened in their life and somebody has to let go of something. There's this guy that, that lived in Vienna, Georgia, which is about 10 miles north of where I grew up. His name's Jimmy Maxey. And Jimmy was a farmer and a, a pretty much an expert with a welding torch. And some of the area farmers would bring uh, their uh, peanut wagons and their combines and, and whatever piece of equipment needed some work done on it, they would bring it to Jimmy and he could make it as good as new. He was a whiz. And he decided on the side, I'm going to do something creative with this skill that I have. A friend of his came and said, Jimmy, you're pretty good with sheet metal work. Could you make me a big smoking grill? He said, sure. I, give me a little bit of time. Give me a few specs and, and I can make that happen. Well, this guy has now won more than a million dollars in barbecue competitions all over the country. And he started out by using one of Jimmy Maxey's grills. 
And Jimmy got pretty good at it. I have one of Jimmy's grills in my carport. Um, Jimmy one day had a knock at the door. And it was a guy in a suit who was from a company in Texas. And the guy came up, he said, you know, I ran into one of your grills at this barbecue competition in Memphis. And I was wondering if we could go into business together. And Jimmy said, well, what are you talking about? He said, well, listen, I'm willing to offer you several million dollars for your design and your willingness to make so many grills every month. How many do you make right now? Jimmy said, I make one or two if I feel like it every month. And the guy said, well, you'd have to do a little bit more than that. And he said, well, how many we're we talking about? He said, well, we'd need probably several hundred every month because we sell these all over the country. And Jimmy said, you know what? I'm not interested. A couple of weeks later, he told his son and some other friends about it. And they said, are you crazy? You're scraping by just fixing peanut wagons and combines. You could have had it made. He said, no, no. That kind of money comes with strings attached. And next week, if I don't want to make any grills, I don't have to. Because I don't owe anybody anything. Change came to Jimmy's life. And he made some decisions about it. There's a story about a church that I know who hired a pastor. And their most important criteria for the search committee as they were going and looking for pastors is they wanted someone who had a proven track record for growth in churches. They wanted someone with a proven track record, someone who could point to statistics and say, look, I took this church from here to hear. They found somebody. Uh, it was a young guy, and he had taken the church where he was, uh, and they had grown more than 300% over a number of years. 300% growth. And they said, we want you to come and be our pastor. He said, well, there's just one thing. There's just one thing. If I'm going to come and be your pastor, I'm going to need to have complete control of everything. If I'm going to come, I have to be able to do it my way. My way or no way. If I can't have complete control of everything, I am not going to come. If I want to change the carpet one day just because I feel like a different carpet color will help get more people in the door, you have to say, okay. Well, the church wanted to grow so bad, they agreed to it. And within a year, the people that were there before that pastor came said they almost couldn't recognize their church. So much had changed over just a year. They didn't recognize their church. They had more than twice the number of people, but they almost didn't recognize their church. These stories are about change, and they're about what we do when change comes to our lives, whether we hang on to things as they have been, as they are, or whether we let go and move into what might be or might not. Let me tell you one more story about change, and this one comes from the book of Acts, the sixth chapter. Beginning with verse 1. Now during those days when the disciples were increasing in number... The Hellenists, that is the Greek-speaking, the, the, the culturally Greek Jews, uh, complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And the twelve called together the whole community of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. Therefore, friends... Select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint to this task. While we, for our part, will devote ourselves to prayer and serving the word. And what they said pleased the whole community. So they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, together with Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. 
And they had these men stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to spread, and the number of the disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Imagine a young church growing and increasing in number. Multiple times already through these first chapters of Acts, we're told how this community of faith, the ecclesia, is growing and increasing in number. The apostles have been doing signs and wonders. They have been healing people. They have been transforming lives. There have been miraculous escapes from prison. We're told that that they were diligent in their preaching and teaching, even when it meant they might be arrested. The apostles, the the twelve, are constantly in prayer. Uh, And already in Acts, we've heard some very particular things about what this community looks like. And one of the things that we're told several times in those first four chapters of Acts is that, that the community holds everything together in common so that none have any needs. All are cared for by the generosity of all. There have been two stories in particular uh, just in the last uh, chapter and a half about people who have sold some of their possessions, some of their land, and given the money to the apostles to use in the community, to go towards the good of the whole community. In one story, we're told about Barnabas who sold a piece of land and gave all that he made on it to the apostles to use as they saw fit. And then on the other hand, there's a story that we read the other day about Ananias and Sapphira who agree to this amount of money for this piece of land and, and they sell it and instead of giving that amount of money to God that they agreed upon, they held back part of it. And in the end, they're struck dead. And that story, we're told, caused a significant amount of uproar within the community, that, that action of them falling dead because they held back. And these stories that we've read before are from the supply side of things, right? They're from the stories about the money coming in and how that money got there. And and obviously, this practice is working well so far. I mean, it wouldn't be a stretch to think that part of the reason why this community is growing and increasing in number is because when people come and join and become a part of this community, what happens? Their needs are met. That's not a bad place to be, is it? You come and be a part of this community and you will be taken care of whether you have a lot to give or whether you have little to give. It's a good place to be. No wonder people are coming in throngs to be a part of this community. And then in these words for today, we hear about some conflict. We hear about some conflict in the early life of this early church. And we know because we've read farther along in Scripture, there's plenty more conflict to come, right? It's kind of the story of when you get a group of people together, you get more than one opinion, there's going to be a little conflict. But this conflict, this particular story that we hear today, is more about the demand side of things. What's being done with the money, with these resources, with the ways that the community is trying to meet people's needs? I mean, we hear the the context for this conflict. We're told right at the beginning, it happens during those days when the disciples uh, were increasing in number. When more are joining the community, that's when this happens. This conflict is happening during a period of growth in the community. Um, I I don't want, because, you know, Luke there at the beginning, he makes this distinction between the Hellenists and the Hebrews, the Greek-speaking Jews, and the Jews that speak Hebrew. He makes some distinction there. I don't want us to get caught up in, in that there's these two very divisive camps here, and that Luke's trying to give us some insight there. I, I, I think you could make the mistake and get too hung up that it's this group against this other group. Really, the point here is that this community is becoming more complex. The farther they move out beyond this original 12, the more people that are added to the community, the more complex the community becomes because there are people coming in with all different kinds of experiences. 
If I ask you all to raise your hand right now, if I ask you all to raise your hand and make a distinction between those who grew up Baptists from the cradle roll versus those who are in and a part of this church because of a new step in their faith journey. Maybe you grew up Lutheran, maybe you grew up Presbyterian, maybe you grew up Catholic or Episcopal. There would be some distinction, right? Yet we all bring all of our past experiences into the community. It becomes complex. We don't all have the same way of thinking, all have the same backgrounds. We don't all have the same histories. It's the same with this early community. There are some differences. You know, sometimes we can get caught up in thinking uh, in polarities, like it's either this or this, that, that growth is always good, that loss is always bad, that conflict is always bad, and that no conflict is always good. You know what I mean? Sometimes we can get caught up in that sort of rigid way of thinking. And, and I think when we hear stories like this, what we ought to do is abandon trying to qualitatively label something as good or bad. What's happening in this early community isn't good or bad. It's a part of a community growing together. Besides, who, who it's bad for and who it's good for might be different depending on what side you're on, right? What might be good for me might be really bad for somebody else. And what might be really good for somebody else might be really bad for me. It was good for that husband to take some time and to get away out of the house and spend time with, with friends. Everybody needs to do that. But at the same time, he left his young wife to tend to the full responsibilities of being a parent. Is that bad? Was it good of her to speak up and want to take that kind of time for herself? Of course it was, but it led to a fight. Is that bad? See what I mean? You have to be careful sometimes trying to qualitatively label something. Good, bad, who's to say? The point is you've got to work through it. you still got to work through it if you're going to be community together. The conflict for this early church comes at a time of growth when they're adding people to their number. And in the meantime, as this conflict is going on, they're still trying to do the things that they feel called to do. They're trying to meet people's needs. They're trying to care for those in the community. And it is out of that that this conflict comes. They weren't doing something dysfunctional. They weren't going off and, and fighting about something that they had no business doing. They were, they were trying to do their work. They were trying to do what God had called them to do, and that's where the conflict arose, is in the midst of being faithful. And what we hear is that somebody's being left out. Someone is being neglected. There's a group who aren't getting their needs met. And I wonder if in that moment, when that comes to the attention of the, the 12 who were at the beginning of this community, I wonder if they thought to themselves, how did we get here? Wait a minute. Just a few weeks ago, we were, we were meeting people's needs. There was excitement. Everybody was enthusiastic. Nobody was saying anything negative. And now all of a sudden we hear, so-and-so left me out. I'm not getting my needs met. Da, 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 da. You've heard that before, hadn't you? Right? Am I? Don't. I'm not the only one, no. Where did, wait, what happened? We went from here, this is where I knew we were at last point, and now we're here. What happened in all of this space of time to get there? So the disciples are at this point of having to figure that out. And they have some choices to make. Either they could just say, well... We're going to just throw all that out. Since it's causing conflict, since, since some people aren't getting their needs met and some are, let's just be fair and not do anything with the money. We won't try and meet anybody's needs. We'll just hang on to it. We could, we could, I know, we'll start a building fund. right? We'll put, it, it, we'll put it in an account and we'll hang on to it. Or let's just give it all away. 
let's just find something and give it all away and, and we won't have to try and do anything anymore. We'll just give the money away because it was causing problems in the first place. No, you can't do those kinds of things. They, they had to live into their full identity, which meant taking care of the people around them in their community. So they have to figure it out. And notice how they respond. They say it's not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. And they're not saying that's below our area of expertise. That's, that's way below what we are called to do. I imagine at some point in the life of this community, those 12 had been a major part of serving those in the community in need. But I think what's happened is the community has gotten so big that if they were to spend their time trying to care for the individual needs of every member of the community, they wouldn't have time to do what? To pray, to preach, to teach, to be attentive to the ministry of the word. And they're realizing we can't do it all. I mean, I wonder how many people had joined the community at this point. Hundreds? Thousands? And we're talking about 12 people. The 12. They can't do everything. They can't make sure every individual is being cared for in the ways that they need to be cared for. It doesn't mean that they don't want to do any of it. It means they can't do all of it. I've seen some pastors use this as a, as a license to get out of anything that they didn't want to do. I've worked with a pastor like that. That's no fun. Everybody has things that they are called to do. Everybody has things that they can do. And we have to figure out how it all gets done. The disciples are trying to figure out how do we use our best gifts, our best gifts in the best way possible to make the most difference. And here's what I see the 12 doing. They're resisting the urge to micromanage and do things themselves. Right? What they could have done is says, well, since this conflict is happening, since since disruption is coming to the whole community. We need to take this upon ourselves and we need to dig in and, and we need to, to, to really take this part of it over and make sure it happens right. They don't do that. They recognize that they can't do it all and they, they ask the community to select seven people, a perfect number in the Hebrew mindset. So they ask them to select a perfect number of people to meet these needs, to take care of of these needs. They delegate because they want to make sure that the work gets done. It's important work. We can't let it go, but we have to stay attentive to other things. And what I think is so important about this story is not that, that a perfect number of people exist within the community to get the work done, although it feels like that sometimes, that that might be the big miracle that there are these people that can step up and that the whole community trusts that are willing to do what needs to be done. The, the bigger miracle for me, the thing that I see, is that these 12 who were at the very beginning point of this community are willing to let go and trust other people in the community to care for it as much as they do. Now that can be a miracle. If you've ever worked with people in business world, whether it's in education or in healthcare, whether it's uh, in a Fortune 500 company, or whether it's at a small operation on a street corner, whether it's in church work, whenever you work with people, to trust somebody new who's coming in and who is taking over, to let go of things and put things in their lap, that is no small task, especially when you care for how the results look, how they sound, how they feel. It is no small miracle that the disciples get out of their own way and appoint others to do that work so that they can stay focused on the vision of the community, on the calling upon their own lives. Sometimes when change happens in our own lives, sometimes when opportunities for growth occur, 
we can get in our own way by hanging on too tightly to the way things have been or to all that we have done or all that we can't control. Sometimes we can, uh, can be a stumbling block, a roadblock to growth. I imagine that the, that the disciples had to wrestle with that themselves. If we let go of this, if we trust them to do it, what if things fall apart? But if they hang on to it, if they don't let go, if they don't trust these others in the community, then what happens to that first century church? It's a part of being in community, being willing to let go as change happens in our lives and embrace the new that is coming to us. And I wonder where you are in your life, whether it's in, within your own family, whether it's in your work, whether it's in your participation in, in this organization, in this church, or in another organization in our community. I wonder if, if you're at a point in your life where the next step towards growing is about letting go of something. I wonder if it's about letting go of something, maybe an I can't do that mentality or I, I, I need to be in the background, I don't need to be up front. I wonder if it is to let go of the need to carry the anger and the pain, old wounds, bitterness, prejudices, ways of believing. What is it that you need to let go of in order to grow. I've had no less than six conversations this week with people who are at different places in their lives about totally different things, and all of them have been about, I need to let go of something. I need to let go of something. I believe that we all have those things in our life that from time to time we need to let go of in order to grow, in order to move forward in faith and trusting that as God has been good to us, so God will be to all of us. Amen and amen. Our hymn of opportunity is number 607. I will sing the wondrous story. As we stand and sing together, if there are any decisions that you need to make, Will you come? Let's stand and sing together.